So Jomel and I are going to talk about three big events uh, that have happened in the church, meaning the Episcopal Church, the Anglican Communion, and, uh, and uh, an ecumenical, the Worldwide World Council of Churches this year. Um, so let's, let's begin. And we, um, so um, the 80th General Convention happened this past summer. Uh, just a brief, most of this is photos, by the way, just a little bit of text, because I, as I emailed Joy Mel last night, I couldn't resist a little polity lesson, tiny, tiny. <laughs> so uh, what is the General Convention? It's the top tier governance structure of the Episcopal Church. It's been meeting since 1785. It was first convened. Uh, when uh, Church of England adherents in the uh, American colonies or, w realized that now we can no longer make an oath of loyalty to the crown, we've got to form our own denomination and we want it to be a national one. Um, and so uh, representatives from what were then called the state church is what we can now call dioceses met together in, in, in 1785. It's bicameral. Uh, the House of Deputies was the first house that was formed. There's the House of Deputies and the House of Bishops. Um, and here's our deputy. <laughs> and again, this is our only 3D slide. Um, and uh, one fun fact is that, so the General Convention since 1789 uh, has met every three years. It's in our Constitution. So it's a triennial meeting. It's only been postponed twice. Uh, it, once this year, it was supposed to meet in 2021, but because of COVID, it uh, met in 2022. The last time it was postponed was in 1798. There was an epidemic in Philadelphia. So same reason, postponed to 1799. Okay, so I mentioned the top tier uh, is the General Convention, and, and one of the things to note about our governmental structure is that every level, there is shared governance between ordained people and lay people. So uh, the top tier is the General Convention. It governs the body at, at the church-wide level. There's the House of Bishops, House of Deputies. House of Bishops is about, uh, I think the membership is in the high 200s, but about 130 or 40 typically come. Um, and the House of Deputies is eight deputies from every diocese, so four clergy and four lay. In the middle tier, of course, we have dioceses, uh, which are our regional bodies, with the bishop diocesan and the diocesan convention, so clergy, uh, bishop, clergy, and laity. And, of course, here we are. I don't like saying the bottom tier, so I say the base, because we're kind of the root, uh, so you have rector and vestry. Can I say something? Yeah, dive in, interrupt me. Exactly. Why, Mary? Yes, very good. Well, okay. So we don't say national church because we're an international church. Um, we're uh, 14 dioceses, uh, dioceses outside the United States, uh, including more than 14 countries because the convocation of Episcopal churches in Europe is in about seven or eight countries in Europe. So we, we are an international church. Now, a little bit of uh, color. When we were litigating in the South Carolina property litigation, uh, in front of a, a sort of a judge that had basically been picked by the other side. She ordered us, meaning me, to refer to the Episcopal, Episcopal Church as the national church. Under, church. under court order, you'll see through all the papers, it's the national church. It was rough. She was not our friend. I also, Mary, can you share with the group what's your role in this structure? Okay, my role in this structure is, um, uh, so the House of Bishops at, at every nine years, every three triennia elects a bishop to be the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church. The House of Deputies confirms that. You all know that that's Michael Bruce Curry now. I am the presiding bishop's chancellor, which means legal advisor, and that includes, it's mostly ecclesiastical law, but some secular law. Thank you. Okay, please dive in with questions too, because I'll just, I'm, realize that I have too much material um, as usual. Okay, this is, I'm gonna make this really fast, but we look kind of like our federal structure, right? Three tiers, sort of national, international, regional, uh, local, uh, but we're really not like that at all because unlike our federal government, which is a government of limited enumerated powers where we had the 10th Amendment where the states reserved all the rights for the states and the people that were not expressly given to the federal government, our general convention 
formed, ratified its own constitution, adopted rules before the constitution was even ratified, and there's no limited, it's, it's completely unlimited authority in the top body. However, subsidiarity, that, the, the principle of subsidiarity is one that is, is sort of throughout the Anglican tradition, which is a principle that holds that whatever is best done or can be done at the local level should be. So that's why you have a lot of autonomy in the Episcopal Church at the local and diocesan levels. But it could be taken away, it's just not. All right, um, impact of COVID-19 on the 80th General Convention. So it was postponed, as we already mentioned. It was shortened. So typically, if there are eight legislative days and then I don't know, five more for those of us who have to scurry around and get ready for it. This time it was four days. Uh, we had, it was smaller, so normally there are about 10,000 people who come and, you know, there are uh, exhibits and there, there are uh, uh, guests and, and people who are observers. It was just the people who had to be there. So it was 1,200 people, mostly bishops and deputies and then support people like me. Um, precautions, so daily tests. When you, when you got there, everybody got five tests. Uh, you had to test every morning, we had to mask, uh, you had to uh, bring proof of vaccination, and then if anybody got sick, they had, were supposed to report. Only 32 reported positive tests. Think about that, 1,200 people. It was in Baltimore. Um, we had a, an, a consultant, this was a really interesting fact, who consulted with us about how to set it up. And we learned that with every two days, you multiplied the infection rate, which is why we held it to four. So if you're gonna have four infections after the, fir the first day, the second day, then you're gonna have eight, and then it's gonna be 16, so the sh shorter we kept it, the better. And there were lots of innovations as a result of COVID-19, so uh, ordinarily the, the General Convention, which of course adopts legislation for the Episcopal Church, um, has legislative hearings before at the beginning of the convention. We started doing that online, and of course that made it accessible to all sorts of people who don't come in person. So that was a, a great innovation. Uh, and despite all that, we still had over 400 resolutions that were filed. Okay, would you like to do this or? Um, or, I mean, dive in and or I'll, you can take some and I'll take, why don't you talk about House of Deputies? It typically rotates. Okay. Yeah. Um, so she's from Oklahoma. The, from Oklahoma, and she was elected for a two-year uh, time until the next general convention that will be in, in Louisville, Kentucky. Louisville, Kentucky. In two years, and uh, she can be re-elected yes. uh, to more uh, uh, sessions. Or, yes. Or, right. And uh, we also had the. Vice President of the House of Deputies, which is the Reverend Rachel Tabor Hamilton, the first indigenous person, Native American, and first ordained woman to have uh, to to be elected for this position in a church. Um, so the way it works is that if the president is a lay person, the vice president is a clergy, or vice versa. So that's why you have a lay person as president, a, a priest um, uh, as the vice president. And, um, so okay, sure. So, um, so some of the things those were that was, those two elections were probably the most noteworthy things that that came out of the convention. Uh, big news. They would have been big news no matter who was elected because that's an important. Those are important roles but even bigger because they were, you know, sort of groundbreaking. 
elections. Um, the uh, general convention adopts the budget for the church. That doesn't mean the budget for St. Albans. It doesn't mean the budget for the diocese. It means that church-wide structure at the top. Uh, just over 100 million for the next two years. A, a lot, a big, big focus on uh, issues of race and um, uh, you know the history of enslaved peoples and, and 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 treatment of indigenous peoples. So there's going to be uh, formed a, something called the Episcopal Coalition for Racial Equity and Justice. Uh, this uh, idea came out of a task force that the presiding bishop and the president of the House of Deputies formed to look at comprehensive ways the church ought to be addressing these issues. I mean, obviously, dioceses are doing it. The church has lots of educational stuff going on, but this will be another step forward. And what I think is particularly interesting about this step is that it, what it's proposing is, is the creation of a coalition where it's not necessarily led from the top. So it will invite dioceses, parishes, schools, seminaries, individuals to be part of this coalition. Um, so the design of the coalition will happen over the next two years. Uh, there is a significant amount of money being committed to research the church's historic ties to indigenous boarding schools. And, and then the reckoning with that will follow. Um, it's something that a few of us have already been working on, but this is a much, much bigger effort. Yes. Uh -huh. Um, another big event uh, or moment was um, as a result of, um, uh, when I say the property litigation, do you all know what I'm talking about? Okay. So, so um, one, of the, one of the dioceses that was not successful in uh, our diocese is not successful along with us, the Episcopal Church, in fighting against the folks who wanted to take the diocese and all of its properties out of the church was the Diocese of Fort Worth. It was a hard hard won, hard lost battle, hard fought battle, and uh, ultimately um, the, the, the folks who did leave and uh, remove the assets were pretty brutal to our folks in terms of, you know, making them turn over the handbells and that were, you know, had family members. I mean, it was, it was rough um, at the end. Um, but our, our Episcopalians in Fort Worth are a resourceful, faithful group, and they have hung in there. They have now, the diocese uh, had to rename itself to the Diocese of North Texas, but now it has been reunified with the Diocese of Texas, which is what it ultimately had been born from. So that was a beautiful moment um, uh, uh, in the, in the, because that required the uh, approval of the General Convention. There's some, uh, uh, there was a first reading of a constitutional amendment. We have to have two votes on a constitutional amendment uh, in the general convention for it to pass. And we had a first reading uh, that of, a, um, of a, an amendment that would begin to define the prayer book more broadly to include rights that have been approved but aren't actually in the physical book. So for example, we have, we have approved rights for same-sex marriage. So that's sort of an ongoing conversation about what do we do about these rights that have been approved but aren't in the book. So it's way more complicated and esoteric than that, although in this lawyer's view it doesn't have to be, but it is. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, so there's that. Yeah. Not yet. Still the book. 
But, but there are many things that are approved that are outside of the book. And there are even things that are approved that are, for example, enriching our worship, where you still have to, you still have to get the permission of the bishop to use, as opposed to the same sex rights, which you don't. Anyway, it's, there's like layers of complexity, yeah. Um, it's a minefield. Um, and, and then while we were in um, Baltimore, so you may know that most of the bishops in the church are part of this effort called Bishops United Against Gun Violence. Um, and it's a, it's a wonderful effort. It's a very active effort. While we were in Baltimore, uh, there was actually a shooting a few blocks away. Um, I, what I heard, t t I, so I didn't go to the rally because, of course, I was back, you know, reading canons and stuff. But um, what I heard was that uh, a fellow um, was in his car and another fellow maybe approached with a squeegee. And the fellow in his car got out and shot him. Okay, so now we have the photo part. <laughs> so these are pictures from the House of Bishops. There's, sorry it's so fuzzy, but there's the presiding bishop uh, in the middle, obviously, Michael Curry. And I thought it was kind of cool that I found a photo of three guys and three women. <laughs> but so we have lots of women in the House of Bishops now, but there, and you know, this is what the House of Bishops is like, lots of deliberating. Um, yes. Right. We do not represent our doctors. We are there for our own. Exactly. That's a big difference. And we frequently met with Bishop Marianne during the convention to talk about resolutions. And we asked her how she sees a big change or not in the House of Bishops from past conventions. And what she said. Yes, I, I can attest to that, having been around and watched that change. Uh, here's the House of Deputies. So on the left is the, the, out, is the outgoing, she was then outgoing president of the House of Deputies, Gay Jennings, uh, on the dais there. And that's a fuzzy p photo of uh, what the floor looks like. So every, every diocese has a, uh, you know, a sign saying which diocese. Um,
I can say something about that. Um, so Navajo land under our uh, canons is actually technically an area mission. Um, a diocese is a, is a more self-sustaining, typically financially more self-sustaining. So Navajo land as an area mission, uh, as Joe Mel said, hasn't had the uh, canonical ability to elect its own bishop. And this, this resolution would allow them to do that even though they wouldn't, you know, even though they'll remain an area mission. Um, so this is, uh, the, this is Julia Ayala Harris, and this is Gay Jennings handing over the... Uh, Oh my gosh, the gavel, yeah. <laughs> Uh-oh, that's not a good sign. Um, and there's Julia, after, again, accepting uh, the election. This on the left, um, I believe on the left is when uh, is what happened in the House of Bishops when the Diocese of Fort Worth reunified with Texas, and on the right is uh, the Bishops Against Gun Violence uh, marching and rallying uh, you know, the rally after the shooting. Sure. So uh, starting on the right, Gene Sutton, Bishop of Maryland, Ian Douglas, Bishop of Connecticut, although. Next week, his successor is being consecrated. Uh, Michael Curry, obviously the presiding bishop, and I think that's Bonnie Perry, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, no, Dion's Michigan. Um, no, no, Bonnie Perry is somewhere in the Midwest. Is she Michigan? Michigan, okay, so she succeeded Wendell Gibbs, okay. And here's another photo of the rally. You took that, right? Yeah. That's a good pick, yeah. Oh, and, and by the way, we do have worship at General Convention. <laughs> so um, yeah, it was a little bit truncated, and, um, uh, but it, we, we did, you know, morning prayer or Eucharist, yeah. All right, the Lambeth Conference. Um, I wasn't there in person, um, but, uh, so Lambeth is, um, gosh, let me just see. The, the Lambeth Conference is a conference in which the Archbishop of Canterbury brings together the bishops in the Anglican Communion. Uh, and it was first convened in 1867, typically meets every decade. The last one was in 2008. Um, as of today, there are 42 autonomous provinces in the Anglican Communion. The Episcopal Church is one of them. Actually, there are four more member churches which are not full provinces, but anyway, we don't, it doesn't, doesn't matter. So, um, and, then the, and the Lambeth, Lambeth Conference is what is considered one of four instruments of communion. So let me talk about that for a second. Um, so when I was litigating the property case in Virginia, um, uh, so the Falls Church and all that stuff with my colleague David Beers. And um, so the, the other side was arguing that uh, the Episcopal Church actually was obligated to remain in step with the Anglican Communion and by breaking with the Anglican Communion over the issue of human sexuality, you know, we'd essentially left the faith. And we had to explain, well, first of all, that's clearly a First Amendment question that courts can't consider. But we, we, so we had to make that argument, but we also wanted to show the judge that actually the Anglican Communion has no say over us. We're, we're independent churches. So then, of course, we had to explain what is the Anglican Communion. And so we, of course, had experts that got on the stand, but David Beers and I, would, we would sort of walk around saying, it's a hope, it's a fellowship. <laughs> it's not a corporation that we, the judge would ask, well, where is it, where is it located? It's not located anywhere because it's, it's a hope. <laughs> so I don't think we ever did the gesture in court, but we really had a lot of fun with that. But so there are four, so there's all this sort of that kind of language around the Lang Anglican communion, including there are four instruments of communion, okay? One of them, one of those is the Lambeth Conference. It's, and I think it's, instrument, it's an instrument of bringing people together, right, and communing. The other, uh, the ABC, the Archbishop of Canterbury himself, is an instrument of communion. There's a meeting of the primates 
of all the uh, of all the provinces. So Michael Curry went off to one. Maybe it was virtual. Anyway, earlier this year, uh, and there's then there's a body called the Anglican Consultative Council, and on all the pr churches can send. Um, representatives to, and they actually pass things, and, but they only govern themselves. They don't govern, uh, they don't govern any of the member churches. And then um, I'm, I'm just going to put a plug in for something called uh, the Common Principles. So there was an effort in 2008, when things were quite frayed, to look for other indicia of commonality. And so a number of the uh, chancellors and, and other governmentally minded folks from around the communion got together, led by the uh, Chancellor to the Archbishop of Canterbury, and pulled together a slim volume that looked at the, looked at the uh, governing documents of all the churches and looked for common principles. And so it's a little volume called um, Common Principles of uh, Principles of Canon Law uh, Common to the Churches in the Anglican Communion. And so uh, it was decided that uh, leading up to this particular Lambeth conference that we ought to look at it again. And so, uh, so I was on the group of 12 people that worked on the revision of that. And you can imagine that it mostly, most things didn't change. But the biggie was, uh, was marriage. And so because in 08, the principle I think was 70.1, uh, was that marriage is between a man and a woman. And so then the group of 12 of us, and I think I and the Canadian, were the lone ones from churches where that's no longer the case, it's no longer limited that way, you know, had conversations about how to deal with that. And what we ultimately did is we said, there is no common principle on this. And we're, you know, okay. So that's what happened. Some people have suggested that that, that volume, that effort, should be a fifth instrument. I'm not sure I believe that, but just, just to let you know. Okay, some interesting facts. So uh, the uh, bishops from Nigeria, Uganda, and Rwanda did not attend. So they still very much object to being anywhere near <laughs> uh, the bishops of churches who are embracing same-sex marriage. Um, about a month and a half, so the Lambeth Conference began formally on August 1st, although they started to gather in late July. Um, about a month and a half before it started, uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury issued to all the, all the attending bishops something called the Lambeth Calls. And the calls uh, were on these topics. Mission and evangelism, safe church, Anglican identity, reconciliation, human dignity, note, uh, environment and sustainable development, Christian unity, interfaith relations, discipleship, science and faith. I mean, great big topics, and the idea was we're going to get together, we're going to talk about them, and we're going to vote on these calls. Okay, so pause for a minute. Vote? Why would we vote? We don't bind anybody. Okay. Um, so as soon as the uh, bishops in this church received the, the calls and read the one on human dignity, which had lots of stuff about, you know, uh, disrespecting indigenous peoples and violence against women and, and, col and colonialism and all this stuff that everyone would agree about. There was the paragraph about human sexuality, and it, and it adhered to the old view. And so the Episcopal bishops were like, no, <laughs> we're, not, we're not doing that. Um, so, uh, Things unfolded, a lot of stuff happened, but I tried to drill it down to the to bare minimum. minimum. The archbishop changed the voting process, so there, were, there was no binding voting. Um, uh, the cons as they were talking ab about all of this, the conservative bishops who were there refused to take communion when the rest of the uh, communion bishops were, were uh, celebrating the Eucharist. And then when they came to the day when they were going to um, discuss the uh, call on human dignity, which was the one that included the, the uh, issue of human sexuality. I'm not going to read all of Archbishop Welby's remarks, but he, he said some things that were so helpful. And uh, here's, what he said. here's some of what he said. Most of the call on human dignity, including sexuality, is uncontentious. None of us would want to argue for violence and conflict, 
abuse of the vulnerable, or violence against minorities or women. But paragraph 2.3 is very different. And now I'm leaping ahead a little bit. For the large majority of the Anglican communion, the traditional understanding of marriage is something that is understood, accepted, and without question, not only by bishops, but their entire church and the societies in which they live. For them, to question this teaching is unthinkable and in many countries would make the church a victim of derision, contempt, and even attack. For many churches to change traditional teaching challenges their very existence. And this is what was groundbreaking. For a minority, we can say almost the same. They have not arrived lightly at their ideas that traditional teaching needs to change. They are not careless about scripture. <laughs> Sorry. Um, they do not reject Christ, but they have come to a different view on sexuality after long prayer, deep study, and reflection on understandings of human nature. For them, to question this different teaching is unthinkable, and in many countries is making the church a victim of derision, contempt, and even attack. For these churches, not to change traditional teaching challenges their very existence. So let us not treat each other lightly or carelessly. We are deeply divided. That will not end soon. We are called by Christ himself, both to truth and unity. And he ends by saying, I want to end by repeating this line from the call on human dignity. As bishops, we remain committed to listening and walking together to the maximum possible degree, despite our dis deep disagreement on these issues. So later that day, or maybe it was the next day, the presiding bishop uh, issued a statement, um, and I thought about making you watch the recording, but that's just too much. So, <laughs> so I just want to note that he said, he said a lot, but he said, this is the first time, well, let me back up. My friends, I've been a bishop 22 years. I've been a priest over 40 years, and I have to tell you that as far as I know, that this is the first time a document in the Anglican Communion has recognized that there is a plurality of view on marriage and that these are perspectives that reflect deep theological and biblical work and reflection. So, progress. And I think people felt that this Lambeth Conference was, ended up a success. Um, so this is Justin Welby. He gets a lot of credit in my view. Here are the bishops of the Anglican Communion. These are the women bishops, a growing number. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like. Before I was a council of Yep. And then, of course, they get a, an audience with the Queen. Yeah. And, um, yep. I meant to bring what. She, she, she made a remark about the importance of the Anglican Communion, especially during these times, holding to our faith and living to our principles. There she is, great lady. Um, World Council of Churches. <laughs>